feel like I turned my microphone off too soon because the singing was so beautiful today. May God be exalted in our midst. We're going to read from God's word from Luke chapter 10. Last week, Gary spoke in one of the parables and today I'm speaking on the parable of the Good Samaritan and next week, Sue is speaking on another parable as well. We're going to read from Luke chapter 10, but let me pray first. Our Lord, we come before you and we thank you that you speak. And we thank you for these parables that speak to our heart. May something new, a challenge from you to our hearts come from reading this word. And may we leave here knowing that we are right with you and knowing that we want to obey your word. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm reading from Luke chapter 10. We're picking it up from verse 25. I'm reading in the RSV. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, that's Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, well, What is written in the law? How do you read? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered right. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbour? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which is about two days' pay, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you will spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved neighbour to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Now, I think it's pretty true to say that within the Western world, these, this parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, and perhaps the parable of the prodigal son are the best known parables of our Lord Jesus even today. And yet, we can read it and read it, but we need to find, in that sense, something fresh out of it and not allow it just to wash over us. Sometimes the police, when they can't solve a case and it's been open for many years, have what they call a cold case. And they bring in people with fresh eyes to look at all the evidence to see if they've missed something to enable them to put their finger on capturing the particular person that's perpetrated a crime. And so in one sense, it would be good with fresh eyes. And I've prayed to God that he'd give me some fresh eyes, just to pick out a few little things that we might go away today with that might be good for our heart. So we've got one guy, what I'm calling the lawyer, one offside. Here is this lawyer. He's a theological lawyer. He's 
a man well schooled in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. But he came to test Jesus, to trick him, to embarrass him, to trick him up in some way. And he asked him this question. He said, "What teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord answered him. Well, actually, he answered his own question. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. And the Lord said to him, you've answered right. Do this, or the emphasis is on keep on doing this, and you shall win, you shall live. Keep on doing this, and you shall live. The same emphasis for this lawyer is given at the end of the passage about and which one showed mercy on him, the Lord Jesus said to him, go and keep on going and do this. You see, friends, we need to beware of having that spirit of the lawyer here, of having Bible truths that are right in the head but dormant in the heart. Because this lawyer knew that he could pick a verse from Deuteronomy He could pick a verse from Leviticus about loving your neighbour as yourself, but he wasn't in the position with a heart humble before God to obey what God was saying. He had a different disposition altogether. He wanted to trick Jesus. We must beware of having Bible truths that are right in the head but dormant in the heart. What high honour Jesus gives to the scripture For Jesus said to the man, well, what's written in the law? How do you read? And see, Jesus took him back to the word of God. And the man had, he was compelled, because he knew the law, to speak from it. And the challenge for us is, am I going to actively let what I know to be the truth from God's word shape my life, my actions, my habits and way of life? That's the challenge, I think, from us or something here from in this perspective with the lawyer. Am I going to actively, consciously let what I know to be truth from God's word shape my life, my actions and my habits? And so I think we can pray, O Lord, so implant a love for your word in my heart that the reflex response is a prompt, obedient to all truths revealed. And that we might have like Ezra 7, 10, Ezra a scribe. He said, Ezra set his heart to study the law of God and to do it and then to teach it. So Ezra, with a great mind that he had as a scribe and a priest, he set his heart to study God's word with a view to obedience. And that's the correct order that we are to have before God. Read it with a view to obeying what God has there for us by his grace. James 1.12, you might remember, says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Friends, we're to be doers, active doers of what God has said in his word by his grace for his glory. And in this context, showing mercy particularly. As I was preparing, it's amazing when you sit back and you pray and you think, how God shapes your life and how he brings things to your memory. I'd like to share with you an illustration um, about my father in the 1990s. In Perth, I was in a city church called Maylands, about five kilometres from the city, and Dad was in Marmion, which is right on the coast. And he rang me up one day and said, are you home, Mark? I said, yes. He said, well, can I come across and see you? I said, oh, yes, yeah, sure, I'm, I'm going to be here. So he drove that 30 minutes across from the coast through to me at that church in the Mance at Maylands. And he came there to share with me his Bible reading for the day. You see, I was bruised. I was down. I was discouraged in the pastorate where I was. And on that particular day, my father was reading the story of Elijah that Elijah was by the brook Cherith, and it was by that brook that the ravens came and fed him with meat and bread morning and night, and he could drink from the brook. 
And my father said, Mark, Elijah was kept by God and was in the centre of God's will, even when nothing seemed to be happening. So be encouraged. You know, for me, it was like a breath of fresh air. But my father was obedient to the nudges of the Spirit as he read the word and he got up and as an act of mercy and compassion, he drove to me and he shared his reading and it put new life into me because I couldn't see anything happening. But Dad said, Elijah was in the centre of God's will even when there doesn't appear to be much happening. And I needed to hear that. And so I thank God that he demonstrated a willingness to read the word and to respond in obedience to that word in an act of mercy to me, his own son. Blessed are the merciful, our Lord Jesus said, for they shall receive mercy. So with this lawyer who was the one offside, Let us pray to God that he will make it such in our lives that we read with a view to obeying him at his promptings, at his nudgings, never disputing that sense with him, but being free in our obedience to trust him at all times. And then there's two, I'd say, I'm going to call them, two on the other side, who we call the priest and the Levite. Now remember, this guy had been, first of all, robbed, beaten. Robbed has been bad enough, but being beaten up is also pretty shocking. I don't know why they beat him. Last year in Perth, I was beaten in the face and knocked out. I don't know whether you've ever been beaten or that. It's not very nice, but there's nothing you can do about it. And you just got to wait until someone comes to your rescue. Or someone up and help me. And with this guy, he was on, obviously knocked out or close, left for dead. But the priest and the Levite, who the priest involved with the temple offerings and the Levites also involved with the worship and instruments in the temple, these two, it, pretty quickly, he said, just walk past on the other side. They perhaps finished their duties because they're on a roster and they didn't want to touch this man because they'd become unclean and then they'd have to go home and rent their clothes and wash them out, cost them money and all that sort of stuff. But whatever it was, they just went past on the other side as if nothing had happened. You know, I remember a situation when in 2012, roughly, I was working for the Salvation Army. I wasn't a Salvation Army officer. I was in Perth just working in their uh, department of uh, uh, fundraising. And I left the building at lunchtime to go out to get some lunch. And as I went out that street... There was a man stretched on the street in the shade and he obviously looked drunk. I wasn't looking in a good spot. And I thought, oh boy, what am I going to do? I'll go get my lunch first and come back and see if I can help him. So I walked past him. Got my lunch. But by the time I come back, there were about three or four uniformed officers of the Salvation Army helping him. But I walked past him. I can't understand what I did. I should have just stopped. I was too caught up in stuff in my head. Too many rationalisations. I don't know what it was. But I knew what it was like to walk past somebody in need. And perhaps you have too. It's not good. I missed out on the blessing of ministering to that man and of maybe helping him. And so when you think about these two men, the priest and the Levite, perhaps we need sometimes to repent of our own hard-heartedness and callousness to the plight of others or our indifference to their plight. Because in that day, as I reflect on that day, I was just caught up in other stuff, rationalising. We just need to take a breath and kneel down sometimes, get involved, take a risk. I want to bring a couple of illustrations too from family life here and in relationship to not walking past but thinking about what's going on. In our family, in the book of 1 Timothy 5, it says, if anyone does not provide for his own relatives and especially 
for his family, he has disowned the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if we are to show compassion and go on showing compassion, then surely we've got to think, how does it, how does it relate to me and my family? I remember in 2012, my brother Warwick, who, mind you, had been homeless by choice for 30 years, turned up in Perth. I hadn't seen him at that stage for 15 years. But he turned up out of the blue and over a period of five days, I worked hard trying to get him somewhere to live. And actually, I achieved it. I got him a place at a place called Casson Homes, where my own sister had lived for 20 odd years. And he walked out of that within two days. And then I got him a place back at the Salvos, was being in, working in the Salvos. That was pretty good inside stuff. And he walked out of that within three days. I did what I could do and then it was too much for me. It actually made me unwell. But at least I tried something for him. I tried to see his need. I tried and had a go at helping him. But to his credit, he did say to me, Mark, I've been on the, on the run basically for 30 years. To stay in the one spot for two nights is too hard. You know, he just wanted to keep on moving, keep on moving, keep on moving. But the good thing is at the moment, he's been in the one house for six years. That's amazing. Down in New South Wales. For they give thanks. But then there might be another one. I've got another one, another son, who struggled sometimes, and even this year, with drugs. So how do you help some of these ones that you love in your family? What are you going to do with them in their particular need? Well, you've got to be discerning. You're going to give him money and so that maybe it's going to do him harm. I think God wants us to be merciful but mixed with discernment. There might be other ways that we can help discernment as well as mercifulness. But God challenges us here in the word Am I compassionate with those in my family? Are my eyes open to their needs? And then what about the fellowship of God's people? Paul says to us elsewhere in Galatians 6.10, Do good to all men, especially to those of the household of faith. What about those within our circle of God's people here? When we know of a need, when we know someone needs compassion and mercy, Surely, surely we could think of them, find a way maybe of touching them in some way. But not only that, the Lord wants us to be neighbourly overall. The thrust of this whole parable is to be neighbourly to all. Not only family, not only those within fellowship, but to all people as best as we can. I remember Margita last year um, when we had our honeymoon, we came back to Perth and Margita shot back eventually to Rome with Talia and they were in Rome. And there they knelt down with a homeless man in Rome and he had three cups in front of him. One was for food, one was for rehab, the other cup was for Disneyland. (laughs) I'm not too sure where she put the money. But she knelt down and touched him and got involved. Sometimes God calls us to do that. We have to be careful in some cases, but let's not just walk past all the time. Maybe there's something simple we can do for them. And as I thought about this, I thought, well, you know, sometimes people ask for money every now and then. It might be good to keep $20 in the glove box and you can buy somebody a meal occasionally. I mean, sometimes that might be appropriate. At other times you might think, Lord... How can I help those who are homeless, need rehabilitation? You might send the Salvation Army or St Vincent de Paul somebody a cheque to help them fund their work, different to what we do as a church. But nevertheless, significant overall. So here were these two guys who walked on the other side, didn't want to get their hands dirty at all, too caught up in their own stuff, just as I was that day. It's so easy to get caught up in your own stuff and rationalise things than actually get involved and risk it. 
And then there's one on side, that's the Good Samaritan. Now, we know from Scripture that the Samaritans were really, really, really hated by the Jews. They had an 800-year history where the Jews were taken off to the Assyrian exile and they intermarried, some of them with the Assyrians, and they were half Jews and, you know, it just was bad news. They had nothing to do with each other. Remember John 4 where the woman at the well said to Jesus, well, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. She knew that and she was a woman, but he had nothing to do with this. But here is this Samaritan man coming on the same track as the others have been walking. And he says here, he was moved with compassion. It's the same word that's used of the father in the, in the prodigal son, moved with compassion. He wasn't concerned about his own safety. Interesting. He put aside any inconvenience and delay to his own business. He knelt and touched, no doubt, obviously, this man. Perhaps he even spoke to him. I remember years ago, a man in 2J, West Australia, another friend of his was shot and he knelt down by him to keep him warm and said, who did this to you? Or maybe, as the Good Samaritan was binding up his wounds, he just talked to him gently, gave him some reassurance, why not? But whatever it was, he put him on his donkey, transported him to the inn, he cared for him overnight, it would appear that he didn't have much sleep, but this guy needed it, he needed more care. And then he paid, in the two denarii, equivalent of 24 days accommodation for this man so he could get stronger. He was obviously quite beaten up. And he gave help at the scene and then this generous provision for the future. What an example and what a shock it was for this young lawyer to hear this illustration. Friends, whatever God calls us to be and do, in life with others. Let's be flexible, adaptable, manoeuvrable, ready to improvise that we might show the compassion and the mercy of our God to somebody else as well. Now, over the years, there's been some debate about whether the Good Samaritan refers to Christ and other things. I don't believe that there's accurate exegesis of scripture. But I can't let a good message, I can't let a message go without putting in something of the wonderful gospel. Do you know that in Acts chapter 1, our Lord Jesus said in verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Who were the ones that brought the message of the gospel to the Samaritans? Well, they were the Jews. Amazing. Philip came down and then later Peter and John came down to the Samaritans and they laid hands upon them. So again, this, the reverse again, these Jews came down and they laid hands upon the Samaritans. You see, God is a merciful God and the gospel is about this God who is rich in mercy and the great love which he loved us made us alive together with Christ. Every person is dead in trespasses and sins until they've made, been made alive by God. We have no association with God. We have no relationship with God. We need God to do a work in our souls and to bring us alive to him. And it happens when we repent of our sin and we turn to faith in Jesus Christ. And it's then that we have forgiveness of sins through the tender mercies of our God that our God left heaven's glory to be and became a man in the person of Jesus. And it's in the person of Jesus that our sins were born continually or completely for us. So the God, our God, heals the brokenhearted. And we need to cry out to him to have mercy upon our souls and to bring us closer to him. The other thing I want to say is this. If you think of that robber, the man that was robbed, sorry, and in not a good state, and let's say he did need to spend many days and maybe weeks before the Good Samaritan came back to him, how do you think his attitude would be toward that man? Well, I think he'd be one of great gratitude, wouldn't you? That this man did something that others didn't do 
He looked after me. He cared for me. He gave me another opportunity or an opportunity for further life. And I want to encourage you, friends, to think about being grateful to God afresh for those that have shown you mercy somewhere along your line, somewhere in your life. Maybe they have provided you with some money. Maybe they have bought you some groceries. Maybe somebody has given you the loan of a car or offered you accommodation overnight or for a while. I don't know. But I want you to, and I want to encourage you to write them a letter. Send them an email and say, thank you for that time when you did this for me. It might put new life into them. It might encourage them to think about that time and to realise that if we are to truly reflect the character of God who is merciful, that we are to be merciful and to look continually for opportunities to be that as well. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we want to thank you for your word. We thank you for that good Samaritan who is prepared to get involved, prepared to risk it, not, not, not uh, worried about his own situation, but to help this man in need. We pray that you take the blinkers of our own eye and you'd help us to be able to look around and see where we can show mercy actively as you would have us show mercy. Above all, Lord, we pray that we might enjoy the deep and rich mercy that you give us and the forgiveness of sins in, the, in our Lord Jesus Christ. And may you change us for your own glory's sake. We think of Micah who said, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to show mercy and to walk humbly with our God. May you help us, O Lord, to do that. And we pray that in Jesus' loving name. Amen.